Thank you. Um, so yeah, where were we? So yeah, Brad, um, tell us your story. You're from New Zealand? <laughs> You've done this plenty of times, haven't you? Yes, I have. Okay. Um, so, my my story. Yeah. And you're supposed to ask questions. Yeah, tell us your story. Okay. Like, where are you from? <laughs> How do you get started in this? Um, okay. Well, it's a long story. Uh, okay. So, for all of you who don't know me, which is this half of the room, this, this half is mostly people that I pay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But thanks for coming down as well. well yeah, um, they, did, they did have to pick between you and Cam, yeah. so he, they, they're showing you support. Yeah, our, they're showing who their favorite co-founder is. Exactly. Our other co-founder is, on, is co having another event on the other side of town this evening, so I, I, we'll be checking the numbers to see who won that one. Okay. Um, so moved to Singapore, uh, mm -hmm. well, coming up six years now. So I okay. uh, started the company with my brother Cameron okay. um, and the third co-founder Carl, who since like not so much part of the company anymore still okay. good friends but kind of fell out but so yeah born and bred in new zealand grew up in the most i, I guess stereotypical kiwi fashion you could i grew up on a kiwi fruit orchard um so it was a kiwi fruit orchard but we also we also raised sheep um so <laughs> <laughs> so that was you and your four brothers yeah me me, me and three brothers oh um, right okay. yeah three brothers 25 sheep um a couple, <laughs> couple of dogs there are more people half a dozen then. chickens <laughs> Um, and, and a cat. Okay. So yeah, it was, a, it was a, a very, like various, just a stereotype, like through and through. But it was great. Uh, so, uh, my father was kind of an mm -hmm. architect wannabe turned engineer. So I what really- What kind of an engineer was he? Uh, so not like a, I studied engineering kind of engineer, as in like, hey, there's something you want built. Tell me about it, I'll work out how to build it and build it. Um, That's cool. It's okay. quite cool. So he's been his life, like, it's actually quite funny. So he, well, funny, it's, well, I guess it's funny. Uh, the world today, so obviously kiwi fruit orcharding, like or being, like picking kiwi fruit, it's grown all over the world. And so about 25% of the technology they use to pick kiwi fruit internationally, my dad invented at the age of 20, because he was being an orchardist, and he's like, this makes no sense, I'm gonna do this instead, and then. What is kiwi fruit picking technology? Uh, things like, just... like the trailers you need and the processing okay. units and that sort of stuff, how you, how you grow them, even sort of scaffolding. So he, okay. just, he just saw problems and fixed them and then gave them away, and gave away his ideas. Okay. Because um, again, that's also a very kiwi, stereotypical kiwi thing is that we, we're great at solving problems at really bad mm -hmm. at money monetizing them. Okay. Um, so <laughs> and that, that was literally my dad, but I grew up in this environment of creativity. Uh, I never got yelled at for pulling things apart um, and trying to put them back together. What did you do in school? <laughs> uh, high school, I guess, yeah. you're going back to. Uh, so actually, uh, my high school years was, I focused mostly on some of the, like your, your hard sciences, chemistry, okay. physics, maths, but also English and some history as well. But actually, the, I think we were leading into this, this leading question was about is that I actually went and studied psychology at university, so uh, nothing to do with computer science I think you're supposed to wait for me to ask this question. No, so uh, like, Here's I, I, can, I can see where you're leading that to. Um, <laughs> Because that's the funny part of the story is that I actually don't have a comp sci degree in any way, um, and actually I think half of my team doesn't either, which is I think that's it's just a great one. It's a okay. great thing to self learn. Well, Sorry, what do you do for work when you first started out? <laughs> like, uh, what age of my life were we up to so yeah. far? Like, no, like 18, when you, when you graduated from like psychology degree, like what were you doing? Because uh, at one point you were in construction. Yeah. Uh, so you know, uh, so I finished my degree in psychology. Okay. Um, I took a year off, uh, went to South Korea and taught English, uh, like okay. these lovely people over here. Um, Wait, how many of you guys taught English in South Korea? <laughs> <laughs> Is that an interview question? <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, uh, and then I went back, actually I went to med school for okay. six months. Uh, six months and I realized- Medical that, school? Yeah. Okay. I realized I don't like sick people. Um, mm. So uh, uh, turns out that's a pretty important part of being a doctor, uh, is <laughs> being to empathize with sick people. Uh, I like healthy people more, they're really more I interesting. wanted to be a doctor, but I just couldn't take surgery, so I okay. had to. No, I actually cut, cut dead people. It was like cadavers, not like just random people on the street. <laughs> Wait, so here's the quote from like Trade Gecko's co-founder, I cut dead people. That's, that's going to be a runaway quote for the night. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, what do you do after that? So yeah, so we went to mid school for a while, dropped out. Okay. Um, and, and, and this is, again, you've already kind of ruined my story here. Uh, but this was back in 2004, that's showing my age a little okay. bit. Um, back when the entire world was in kind of a, a bit of a crisis and there was no job. So I had a degree in psychology, mm -hmm. minoring in, bio, in biochemistry. I had six months of 
uh, six months of med school and I had a year teaching English in, as a okay. third language, as a second language. Um, and so, yeah, I was overqualified and underqualified for every single job I could apply for. So I actually literally applied for over 100 jobs with like customizing the, the cover letter and got, I think, three callbacks and, and no jobs over the period. And so, yeah, I, I just... But, Yikes. Yeah, like, Okay. This is still to make money, right? And so I, I, yeah. I did a bunch of really interesting stuff. And as I said there, I, I was working in construction for a while. It was a mm -hmm. lot of fun. Um, I was a promo girl in supermarkets for a while, giving okay. out like wine samples. Uh, that, that was a lot of fun. You got a lot of free wine from that. Do you drink a lot of that wine? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> was it Taylor's? Is this Australian wine? I've like, actually, I, ha I had it for the first time again last week. It's actually really okay. good. Um, but it's been a long time until I, I could drink that again. Okay. Um, but it's, it's really good. It's pretty solid. Uh, did all sorts of random odd jobs. I remember I, I spent kind of a couple of months painting an industrial chemical storage building um, with a friend of mine. It was actually a lot of fun. Uh, being outdoors, using your using your body. So um, how long was physical. that period? So, oh, okay, a while. Um, okay. So when did you start learning coding? <laughs> that's the question, right? Um, so about. <laughs> sorry, am I making this hard for you? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> this is why it took so long. I think we have a role here. I ask the questions, you answer the questions. You don't get to ask your own questions and answer them. <laughs> not how this works. You told me to tell my story. Um, so, I'm not sure if this is probably further in depth. Most people here were particularly interested in. Um, so, just the, as the, the adage, as the story goes, um, which okay. is, it's true, it's not even made up, uh, which is uh, nice because not all my stories are that way. Um, about 18 months in, I picked up a crossword puzzle. I was over at my, my, my auntie's place for, for mm -hmm. breakfast. Picked up a crossword puzzle and I couldn't fill in a single, a single word. I think it was like a Friday, so it was a really hard crossword puzzle, but mm -hmm. still like, it threw me. And so I actually pick up, um, picked up coding as, as a hobby to, to kind of move my brain a little bit. Um, to do crossword puzzles? Well, I felt, hey, I'm, okay. us I'm, I'm using my body. I was in okay. fantastic physical shape. I had a great tan. I lost that now. Um, but. <laughs> But you supposed to wait for other people to like say those things? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm from New Zealand. I'm all, all about self-deprecation. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I actually, well, okay. so partly because I, I want to use my brain and also, again, uh, if, I don't know, I, I think of I know, almost everyone here, but hopefully mm -hmm. some of you probably met Cameron, uh, my brother, the CEO of Trading Go. He is also, I, I love how this, everything's about stereotypes. He is the stereotype of a startup CEO. Okay. He was about six businesses in. Um, me and him, it were always like it was kind of the creative, creating things, and also the, the entrepreneurial side of things. Mm -hmm. Always been big on that, and so he actually was learning to code. Well, he'd already learned to code, and I said, "Well, that looks kind of cool." Like he wanted to get into the business side of things, and so I say, "I learned because I wanted to use my brain, and same way because I knew that I wanted to get into technology and really be able to make a difference." And well, I think back then it was more about starting a company and taking over the world, but like it's still the, the making the difference at the same time. When do you guys decide that Trade Gecko was a product that you wanted to work for? What problem were you solving? Um, it, well, the second week of our incubator, actually. We came to Singapore with a different idea. Um, what idea do you come up with? Uh, so we came here with, uh, we'd actually built this thing for a, a so it was a con kind of doing consulting work uh, over okay. in, back in New Zealand, and we built this product for a client, um, which was actually, hilariously enough, it's very similar to the, the iPad app that uh, Sheikh had built for us uh, recently. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's for the sales reps. So the, the customer, what they were doing is they were going, they were a pharmacy supplier. Mm -hmm. So they'd go into pharmacies and supermarkets um, looking at tweezers and stuff and just making sure the stock was there. Okay. And so they were going around and product listings, going out and selling products into these places and just being able to manage that. And the original version was built on top of NetSuite. Um, and I was the one doing the NetSuite plugging code and this is yeah seven eight years ago now so there was nothing like json apis or anything okay. like that. so it was a it was a horrible experience um and so we came here going actually let's we build this thing that's solving a real problem let's come mm -hmm. over and let's, let's 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 it was it was time so me we'd actually started like three businesses and which had all flopped in our free time okay and it wasn't until we're like actually we need to sit down. this is something real and sit down actually make the move kind of just cut our ties and go work heads down tails up mm -hmm. for as long as it takes to get something off the ground uh, and so this was, the, this was a solid, solid idea, like, we can productize this. We came to Singapore, joined JFDI, which sadly is now defunct as of this year. They had a good run. Yeah, that um, was the good days. That's the, how back, we met. Back in the old days, yeah. I know. Did we meet at JFDI or did we meet at we JS Conf? JS Camp? What I was it back remember. then? <laughs> 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 the casual plug there, he's not even paying attention. Yeah, we just plugged his conference and he doesn't care. Thomas? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> uh, now I'm not going to tell everyone that they should look forward to JS Conference, which is happening again in January 2018. Yeah. That's correct, 25th to 27th. Okay, so back to point. So you were in JFDI. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so you were at JFDI and you guys like changed your business model and there so was we went Carl, into, you and Cam. Yeah, so it was me, Cam and Carl and we did, we, we, we literally followed the, the, the textbook word for word. Um, mm -hmm. uh, was it Eric Reese was the lean, yeah. that one? Like, the lean startup guy? Was it lean startup was the main one they made us teach? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Um, and so we went and we made the, the customer calls. Mm. And so, uh, to be honest, mostly Carl, uh, mm -hmm. three o'clock in the morning, like for two weeks straight, been like four hours on the phone talking to these customers. Okay. So we're in Singapore and we we're talking to the US and Canada and wherever would kind of answer the phone. And so we talked about, we walked through the problem, we asked them what their problems were, we walked them our solution and, and it was, everyone's like, oh, that's really nice. Okay. Uh, but no one was like, we need that. And so from those conversations and also um, from Carl's experience, we're like, hey, this is just really, like they're saying this is our biggest pain point. Mm -hmm. And Carl, who was actually a fashion designer himself, uh, if we're going back a couple of years, he's like, yeah, this is, this was, like my business went under because of all this stuff. And so just okay. manner, managing the, I guess it's operations, but also like the inventory and sales and all, like just managing okay. the, the, the core data of your system was, they, there was no good solution for them. They had spreadsheets okay. or you had SAP. Um, and so there's obviously a big gap between the two of those. Who were your first few customers? Um, first few actually, so we had a bunch of fashion companies to start mm -hmm. with. Um, so local fashion companies, Australia, New Zealand. So kind of, Carl made, went out and made friends. Uh, if you've ever met Carl, one of the friendliest, like, this is the most extroverted person you'll ever meet. Um, <laughs> but we now made friends, and so we kind of had a, a bunch of fashion companies based mm -hmm. out of uh, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, because we had those, those as well. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, we were just trying to solve that. I, I, did a, I still remember the one line we used to say, but it was part of our pitch way back when was, you know, we were building the Walmart supply chain for everyone else. Um, so it was funny. So around then, and it's, it's, it's a funny story to tell now. Um, sorry, wildly off track, but that's no, I'm sure okay. you'll forgive me. Um, funny story to tell now. So back then, maybe six, about six years ago, there was a story going around the international news, kind of tabloid-esque, about um, this man who went into, went into a Walmart and started yelling at all the staff members because they'd sent a, sent a catalogue for baby, baby um, clothing to his teenage daughter. Oh yeah, that yeah, story. Yeah, um, and so he's like, what the hell's going on? Little, like, just went crazy at him. Like, th th that's not like, mm -hmm. what are you doing? She's blah, blah, blah. And so uh, went home after kind of going crazy. Uh, everyone's apologising. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. Um, he went home and, and his daughter's like, oh, dad, I'm pregnant. Um, and so the story, actually, I think in the story where there's actually the store knew before she even knew based on her yeah. purchasing power. And so back then, that was crazy. Like, t today, that's people are like, yeah, so, yeah, that, yeah, of course. But back then, that was a massive invasion of privacy. We've lost mm -hmm. a lot of privacy, I think, everyone, like, over the last five, six years. Um, but back then, this was this crazy international story about how they had to think, kind of roll back some of this intelligence they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, okay, cool. So your average person obviously can't afford that. Okay. Um, so how can we provide that sort of, like, that automation for, for everyone else? And so, yeah, there was really no one else in the, in the space. There was a couple of kind of desktop-based old school things, and then you had SAP, SAP and, and Oracle um, and Excel in the middle. And I, to be honest, about six years ago was about when browsers became powerful enough to start driving some serious um, applications like, like Tragico. So it was kind of a fortuitous combination of, of timing. Okay. Yeah. And um, how has your product changed from the time you started to now? You mentioned that Cam was working on it for three days before you were like, nope, let me take over. <laughs> so actually, so the, the, the story is that Cameron and Carl were actually here for about four weeks before it, mm -hmm. four or five weeks before I turned up. Okay. Um, so I was, they had the consultancy. I still had, my, I had another job at the time, so I had mm -hmm. to kind of finish up before I, before I came over. Um, yeah, so as I kind of mentioned to you just earlier, you were asking about technology stack. Um, yeah, so I turned up, they, actually, to be fair, it was like a week before I even came over, but I turned up in camera and spent like a week trying to okay. like build out the, the very first 0.0.1 .0 version of Trekkie Girls. Obviously didn't do anything, it was just kind of a basic uh, a gym file more than anything. And yeah, so as one thing that I've been reading about before and I, I, I think I, I like to take as my own these days is that mm -hmm. when, you, when you're building a new, a new platform or something like that, you've got, mm -hmm. basically you get one stretch choice, crazy choice, and everything else needs to be solid for a real, for a real platform, um, real, if you're building a real product. And so Alan walked in, we had Ruby on Rails, which I think was a solid choice, Ember.js, which was a crazy idea back then, but I, pretty, mm -hmm. I think that was a fact, really solid choice. But then we also had Mongo, and so that was kind of my first step, it's like, okay, this is, this was back when, it, well, it, it never, really, never really recovered from the, the back days when they, they just made so many bad mistakes when they first launched that product. So it ripped it out through, through in a much more uh, reasonable data level. <coughs> right okay, and um, what were some of the hardest challenges that you had when you were building TradeGecko? 
Um, is it like such a wide question? That's a massive question. Um, How about the time you got mugged? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, does everyone know that story? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Gary's laughing his ass off there. Oh my god. You were god. with us then, right? I uh, You were just about to join, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it was, okay. I think it was like, maybe it was a week before you were joining. Because that, that was in, must have been late January. So like, yeah, a week or two before you joined. Um, I was in San Francisco for a conference. Uh, you know the story, I, obviously, so I'm still with everyone else. But um, I was in San Francisco for a conference and, uh, well, heading home after the conference I got, well, I had a couple of drinks with the, the people. Mm -hmm. um, and I was heading home and yeah, I, I, got, I got mugged on the way home, had my, my laptop and, and okay. phone and wallet and actually everything but my passport. So I just take my passport out of my laptop bag and put it in my pocket um, to get into the, the, the karaoke bar that we were in. And so I got everything, everything taken. Um, and Priorities. It was just, yeah, of course. Okay. Um, and this was, yeah, and then just kind of what was a, I guess a freak coincidence at the same time, mm -hmm. something went wrong and our, and our service went down. Okay. And so I'm in San Francisco where I know no one, apart from people I just did the conference that I literally met that day, um, who had obviously no contact with, apart from through, mm -hmm. I was Slack, no Slack wasn't even around, but through IRC back then. Um, yeah, and the website went down, I had my stuff stolen, and I was kind of like, oh, fuck, like, that, that's mm -hmm. <laughs> cliche, so like, I, I, I know, I, I feel like, I feel like there was a, a bunch of stuff that would have fit right into like Silicon Valley, the TV show. Um, so, uh, kind of, well, not so much to do it, like, went to bed, left it, and the next morning woke up, was kind of on the, the shitty, sh the mm -hmm. most, the horrible, like, your, your hostile, if you've ever used a hostile computer, that would literally take the worst thing you can find. And I kind of jumped online and just seeing if it was anyone around that I knew, it's kind of more to, to commiserate, I just wanted someone to commiserate with me. I was feeling really sad for myself. Okay. Um, and kind of reached out to, there was one of my Singaporean friends, like I had no, no idea of time zones at the time, there was like one Singaporean <coughs> friend who I think a few of you know, but she was actually, so I was like, oh, how's Singapore going? I was like, oh, I'm actually in San Francisco, right? Like, I'm like, you're fucking kidding me, right? <laughs> um, and so I managed to reach out uh, and like told her my sob story and she actually dropped by, lent me her laptop for, for a couple of, for the day. Um, and, and some cash because I was completely, cause obviously, kind of ripped out. Um, managed to get the side back up, which was which was nice. Mm -hmm. But it was down for about 14 hours, which would be just catastrophic these days. Back then, we had I think we were about 35 customers, uh, 35k mm -hmm. paying customers, and they're all on this, pretty much all in Australia, New Zealand. And I don't know if, if you know many Australian New Zealanders. We don't work on the weekends, um, so it was the Such weekend. Such slackers. Yeah, we, we take us. We have amazing weekends. We can go outside. We go play on the beach. Um, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> So actually, I think about three people noticed. Okay. And again, we're still early on. So we, we actually wasn't, like it wasn't a catastrophe of any kind. Like it, was, it, was, it was just, I think, more of a hilarious story. Okay. Um, they managed to get it back up, got back on the plane, came back. And the first thing I did when I got back was to, to move us <coughs> to, off AWS to Heroku. Um, like I'm like, I, I never want to be the only one who has access to our servers ever again. Okay. So we, we only, we had like a Cameron who was very good with computers mm -hmm. and we had another engineer, uh, Pei at the time. Uh, but. Yeah, I was the only one who had access to the servers, so that was no one could do anything about it. I've got these frantic like when I turned, got the computer back on, jumped on, there was like a million text messages from Cameron going, "Hey, servers on, servers on, servers on, servers on, servers on." Servers on. <laughs> Which is fair. <laughs> Just trying to reach out to CEO, can't, CDO can't get in touch with them, and everything's broken. That's kind of like a crazy story. How was it like, um, you know, getting investors to buy in when you guys first tried raising funding? Okay, that's okay. Um, take a different tangent. Investors buying when we first tried to raise funding. Um, and that's actually what JFDI was all about, was okay. teaching you how to pitch. Well, teaching you to make sure you had a good solid startup idea and then, then how to pitch it. I think, I think to, to be fair, and like probably half our batch and mm -hmm. half of every batch ever since of every startup thing, don't do that first half. And without that first half, you don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and so we got through the first half, the second half really teaching you how to pitch and put together that pitch and work on that, work on that. And so we actually, yeah, it was camera, well, uh, Cam and Carl were working on the pitch and I was working on building something to try and sell. Um, and so, yeah, we, we went, through, went, through, went through pitch day. We did our pitch in front of, must have been 20, 30 investors back then. It's funny to think how scared we were of all these people. Like now, a few- Way to break it. Now a few years in, like we're obviously good friends with like almost every investor in Singapore. It's amazing how scary they were back then. If you had to go back and do GFDI again, would you go back and do it? So I think our JFD by batch was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know too much about the rest of the JFDI batches. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I paid attention to the next couple. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that the, the combination of mentors and then teams in there was just, it was, it was fantastic. Um, 
But we wouldn't have got to where we were today without them. Like okay. I think uh, that was a really, it was a really the best option for us at the time. Um, no, I'm, I'm really glad. Uh, we met a lot of interesting people. Okay, you guys have grown a lot since then. How many people are at Trade Gecko right now? I don't actually know. Um, <laughs> I think we're actually about to hit 100. Uh, so that's uh, across three okay. three offices now. So. And how's the how's the team like structured? Like, what do all these people do? I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so no, what is your role <laughs> as co-founder and CTO, Brad? Tell us what you do for a living. Um, <laughs> I come and drink wine and talk in front of people. No, so we have. Uh, See, no one would have to know that what's in your glass is wine. They could have thought that it was water. Who no. didn't think I was drinking wine right now? I got red teeth. <laughs> Anyone uh, <laughs> who's on like that, watching on the other end of the camera. Oh, okay, hi. Um, <laughs> so, hundred, uh, almost hundred people across three locations. Okay. And so the big parts is all um, our development team is based entirely in Singapore. So okay. So I think we're thirty something people these days. Mm -hmm. um, and then so that's product management, design, uh, engineering. The UX and other stuff around like that. Okay. Um, Is that the team all of you guys are from? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's from something inside of development. Okay, and what's the culture at Trade Gecko like? Well, I managed to convince a bunch of them to come down, so I think pretty good. Um, no, no, I. <laughs> it's either that or it's a dictatorship. <laughs> <laughs> two like, ways what what do you call a two person that? dictatorship? Is this still a dictatorship? Was it like a DOS dictatorship? Just answer my question. <laughs> No, I, the culture is really the, one, is okay. the most important thing for me. Um, so I started this company to work with people that I want to work with every day, and okay. I've done a great job of that. Um, I make a horrible employee. Um, I work, well, to be fair, I worked in a fruit shop before, and that's the only real. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, so I worked in a fruit shop, and I worked, I worked in a dev shop. I also worked mm -hmm. in uh, Deloitte for a while. So okay. I've had a couple of jobs, not just the fruit shop. <laughs> um, you know, no, no, it was really great. It's around, I, I, I think we started with a very, Kiwi, like the okay. initial culture was three of us, and we're like, hey, are you right there, Melissa? Yeah. <laughs> should, I, should I pause? You're right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we started off with a really, the Kiwi culture. So, okay. uh, again, Kiwi culture, we're, we're very laid, we, we, we're laid back, we get shit done. Like, okay. we're, like, don't, like don't figure out, no, no bullshit. So that's kind of our thing. And as we we've have to gone, ask your team, would you guys agree with that? I'm working on that. What's not what we are today? You can ask them in a second. Let me finish oh, yeah? the story. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so we've grown from there. Obviously, starting with three, uh, we're obviously not an entirely New Zealand-based team or anything. Like we're in, we're based in Singapore. We have, okay. I think we're up to like 25, 30 different countries, mm -hmm. if not cultures, inside of Trade Go. Like we've, we've really built around that. Okay. Um, it's so important being in Singapore, where we've obviously got a lot of Singaporeans. Even mm -hmm. inside of Singaporeans, there's a lot of a lot of different um, melting pot, but also bringing people from the best people we can from all around the region, all over the world. And so it's really the main things for us is for me, well, personally, the name for just again, people who are friendly along with others uh, get shit done. They just they care about what they do. They care about growing as, as people. I think that's mm -hmm. um, really the most important part. I think we've done a fantastic job of bringing these people in. Um, sorry, I keep looking at these. these are, th this is some of them, but there's, there's, like, there's almost 100 people now, and I think we've done a What do you look job. for when you hire someone? What kind of people do you like um, hiring? So uh, the rule we have is that everyone we hire needs to like improve the overall culture of our company, which mm -hmm. is a bit of a stretch, and I think we stole that from Amazon as well. But um, <laughs> Amazon's got a lot of amazing stuff to steal. Was it the only thing you stole from Amazon? Uh, not even close. Um, <laughs> uh, no, it's, we, we've spent a lot of time um, mm -hmm. looking at, like, trying to, like, so the first 10, 14 people don't have to think about anything around mm -hmm. culture. You get to 25, 30, you can think a little bit. At 40, there's just this huge change where you do need to document some of these things. So in the first 40 people, everyone spends a lot of time with the co-founders, with the mm -hmm. people who are, who are the core of that. Like everyone had, had time to talk with all of us all the time about things. As you get past 40, it, it just be, doesn't become feasible anymore. So you need to start putting some of these things in, into documentation. And so like we, we stumbled, like we, we, like we wouldn't we didn't go directly to having the perfect culture. We had a couple of, we've had a couple of ups and downs. I, I, I'm actually really happy with the way we are today. Mm -hmm. um, I think we, me and, oh, he didn't make it, he's got a daughter at home, Rohan, um, <coughs> our creative director, we spend a lot of time locked away in a cafe down the road um, working, I promise, uh, working on the, the, the vision, mission, values. Mm -hmm. um, so we did a lot of that stuff, uh, and really both understand it, and then we went back and asked a lot of people to make sure we're on the right page. Um, but yeah, so I think the culture is super important to us. We want to make sure that everyone wants to to be there. We've got, like, we're all trying to, not all trying to, get, we don't all have exactly the same things we want of the thing, but like, as long as it's on the same page, right? Okay. Uh, how does product development, like, you know, you can, you mentioned that you're kind of like in charge of like product dev, am I right to say that? Like the Well, in, in charge is a bit of a stretch. Okay. They oversee it. I'm the one reporting it to the executive team. Okay. Um, 
So I've been spending a lot of time trying to democratize the whole thing. But yes, yeah, so yes, my my half of the company is the product development half. It's the it's, it's, it's the engineers, it's the designers, it's uh, it's uh, product management, a uh, little bit of data. Okay. Um, I'd say that we've only got one person in our data team right now, but <laughs> she's doing a great job. <laughs> she used to be a TA for us before. Yeah. It's like so many GL. I'm in your yeah, course. It's, it's, Awesome. Um, so yeah, um, how does the product dev process at uh, Trigeco work? Um, okay, so I said all of our team is all the mm. product dev, all the is team is in Singapore, which makes mm -hmm. that quite easy. Uh, trying to hold on to that for as long as possible, but eventually we're going to have to open up secondary places for that. But mm -hmm. uh, so what we have is that we do we've broken up the team by functional teams mm -hmm. rather than by like role or anything like that. So we do have functional teams which are made up of product uh, of engineers, of product managing, uh, of designers. So it's generally like a product manager, designer, and, and kind of mm -hmm. three to five, six uh, engineers per, per area. And so we're kind of, that's where we're going at is we're focusing on that, that cross-functional team focusing on a specific area of, of the product or, the, or what the feature we're facing the customer. And that that's, again, has changed over time, but we've finally got to a size where that it really kind of makes sense to focus it that way. Okay, and speaking of like building teams, which other countries are you guys building teams in right now? Uh, so we have had a, uh, the Manila was our very first, our very first second office. Okay. Our office. And so we've had a t team there for coming on two and a half, three years now. Um, it's great. And so we, we have actually it's only like ten people there at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's not a, it's not a huge team. Um, they, they did a lot for us. And Are we've they got more some amazing sales people. and marketing? Or? So they're doing sales and customer support. Okay. Um, and so just kind of handle the, uh, uh, yeah, they will kind of handle those sort of things. Uh, I guess it's a cost reason. I don't know. I'm not like okay. we just found some great people there. Which um, other countries are you in? And so, and then our third office um, we opened in Toronto. At, it must be almost a year ago now. Okay. So literally 12 hours apart. Uh, really good for time zones. For our customers, really hard for us because it's you know, those meetings make it really tricky. But um, we've got some amazing people over there. I've spent a bit of time over there meet, meeting the team and just making sure that the culture side of things works. And like, really, really awesome people. Did Boulder happen? Boulder. Yeah. Boulder? No, we, we have no one in Boulder. No. Okay, okay. Is, is that something I'm, I, it's definitely something I've thought about in the past, but it's a, okay, cool. I don't think, I don't know where that one came from. Because you told me like you guys were planning on like opening up something in Boulder at one point. It was it uh, Boulder or Canada, right? We're looking at, I've, I've been looking at lots of different places. Okay. Uh, Boulder. We're actually now looking at, still looking at lots of different places. Uh, okay. I think the latest one we've added to our list is KL. We're having a look at that. There's some great people out of there, so. Okay. Uh, like the, the easiest time zone in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it's still entirely Singapore, but we're looking at well, how, how do you keep growing the team and growing more and growing. Okay, and um, what are the, some of the biggest um, challenges that you're trying to solve at the moment? How do you grow a team <laughs> past 100 people? Okay. Um, how do you grow an engineering team past 30 people? So when you were first, like, you know, first it was just you, Carlin, um, Cam, right? When you were, like, building the product dev team, what was your idea on, like, you know, wh who, what kind of people you wanted to bring in first and, like, how many people you wanted in certain functions? What do you feel you did right? And what were the things, if you could go back and change certain things about how you built your team, what would you change? Wow. Um, I think I did a fantastic job bringing some really amazing people in very early on. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, still don't know how. We got very, very lucky with Gary. Uh, he was in the JFDI with us. Um, no, I, was I, I had no idea how to hire people back then. It was okay. literally, it was, it was friends and family and people reaching out and we still got like the first little bunch. Then we worked out, okay, like you need to put job postings up and stuff like that and start interviewing people and then um, that worked out pretty well. Um, still, I, I, I would, I don't think we have, I, I would like to, uh, I would, I feel we could definitely be a little bit bigger than we are today, people-wise. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just really bad at the, they, they say that you get to get, when you kind of CEO, CTO, you need to be spending kind of 25 to 50 percent of your time hiring, and that includes this sort of stuff going out and making a face of yourself, um, and then obviously, obviously the hiring process is a pos as well. Um, I think personally, my main thing is that I spent a lot of like I'm I, I was still spending a lot of time, and I, I don't think it was a bad thing, but it was probably not the most valuable at all times. So I was spending mm -hmm. a lot of time building stuff and working with the team and creating things. Um, that being said, I think that is part of the culture is, is that we all work very closely together, and so I could probably have stepped away a little stepped away a little bit more. But I feel if I'd stepped away and actually become that that like like manager CTO type thing, I think that would actually ruin the culture that we have okay. so I'm, I'm, i think there's a there's a fine line in the middle i probably stepped slightly to the to one side but i don't think i was too far off okay how does the day in the life of an engineer at trade gecko look like why are you asking me <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> you're the cdo right? you're supposed to know what your team does uh 
So, okay, so we have, again, we've got these functional okay. teams. So uh, let's go through it. So okay. first thing in the morning, you get to the office somewhere between 9 and 10, 30, 11. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, sometime early, early-ish in the morning. Um, and every time, noon. Oh, I don't think we don't have too many noon starters okay. anymore. Um, actually, that's just me. Uh, but I swear I'm working from home. Um, no, this is really the, the talking to Canada means you need to be up early, and so it's kind of hard to get to the office. Uh, no, so I guess up early, we we'll don't get in, mm -hmm. uh, have a stand up with the team pretty early on, discuss what's going on. Like again, what are what are things they're focusing on? What's your what's your main goal for the day? What are, uh, do you have any blockers? Um, uh, I, I, like, I don't know. Some teams do like what is something interesting you learned yesterday, mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of a little bit hard to do every single day. And so hopefully, yeah, obviously once or like every sprint we're doing the planning, so everyone should know exactly what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's really about coming in. How, how did I go yesterday? Any blockers, commitments? What am I committing to do today? Any blockers? And, it's, and so we kind of go through that process. And then uh, for most of the teams, you'll then sit down with the, the person you're like. I, I think it's kind of almost I would. It's a bit weird, but like semi pairing with. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a lot of. Uh, we try and get most of the interworkings in pairs, but it's not like to the strict, strict pairing you get in a lot of places okay. uh, all the time. And just sit down and kind of like, solve the problem. Um, How do you grow people at Trade Gecko? We throw hard things at them. <laughs> <laughs> it's like <laughs> no, it's just, like, so they make or break it. it well, the, like we give them support network as well. Like okay. you can't you can't push things horribly. Like we have like it, the, the the review process is really important to us, but uh, it's really around just kind of making sure. Well, we've got the checking in, but we okay. try and push people and, and like as, as hard as they're willing to go and mm -hmm. throw people. Like I think a lot of people in this room came in at different sort of very different roles from where they're working on today, um, at very different levels, and it's just around giving okay. you the, the, the chances. Like we've you know, we've got things we need to do, um, but within that, is we try to like, we try and work with, with with the people who are there to, to okay. kind of grow. But at the end of the day, it's we still have a, it's, we still, it's a team of adults, like I'm not, like, it's, it's not, it's not a GA class and I'm not, not giving you a syllabus on how to do things. You come in, we'll, we'll let's work together, work out what you can do and do everything we can to support you to, to build awesome shit. Um, well, so one of the things you mentioned earlier was that you tend to hire a lot of people similar to yourself who are people like without very formal uh, degrees in like CS and stuff. How does that work for you and how do you evaluate whether someone's good enough to join Trig Echo? What's the interview process like? Um, well, I, th I think that it's kind of, you're flipping it the wrong way around, is that our interview process, we just don't check to see if they have the CS degree. Okay. We look at their, we look at their, that they've experienced, and then we, we actually ask very early on if they make it past the sniff test to do a little project for us to really, okay. to prove yourself. So we'll ask you, we've got a couple of these projects we send out depending on which part of the stack you're working on. Mm -hmm. We send it out, we give you a couple of days, just maybe two, three hours work, it's not too much. A um, couple of days and we can bring you back in and then, then they'll sit down with an engineer or two and actually walk through. And we'll ask you questions around, like you don't have to get it, like we're not looking for perfection, but we want, we're going to ask you questions on why you did certain things we want you to answer, we're, like, understanding why you've made some of these choices, and then we'll ask you about alternatives and that sort of thing. So it's really about, I do, have you been thinking about what you're doing, and I like, kind of do you understand what's, what's going on. Okay. And I, I, for me, a, a, concept, a computer science degree gives you lots of in, use, useful information and in, in, um, algorithms and stuff, but for most people who've kind of joined us who are web mm -hmm. dev, they've actually learned the stuff that they need day to day from us, either in their free time or since. Um, so we, we're not in, actually don't know, I don't even know what the specific use case of a comp sci degree is, like, apart from getting you, like, I guess you can become a comp sci teacher. Um, <laughs> um, no, no, that, sorry, that's not fair. I, I actually do. No, I do have a whole lot of respect for com computer science, and, and to be fair, more. No, I know that Singapore does uh, the NUS does a really good computer engineering course, which I think is a actually more hands-on to the real world type stuff. So, it's, no, I, I have nothing against degrees. Like, I, it's not a black mark. I don't know. It's just not a, just, it's not a green mark as well. <laughs> I just mean it's really good that you guys are having a diverse pool of talent. Like you well, guys have hired from yeah. B as well, so that's awesome. Yeah. I think it would be a bit hypocritical if I was not willing to hire people who didn't have like very specific CS degrees when mm -hmm. I literally have no um, CS background myself. Like I, I read this book. Uh, what's it called? <laughs> <laughs> I shared it with you. Did anyway. you just say I read this book? What's it called? I shared it with with Gabriel um, about. It was it was kind of a CS for impossible. She's saying something. Uh, maybe it was, it was something around like s computer science for the imposters, right? And so it was to teach okay. people who had done, who'd done, but they'd been, it was just kind of teaching some okay. like algorithm stuff that um, I'll find the name for that. I, I'm, I'm sure 
that a few people here have read it. Um, I, I actually I shared it with Gabriel. I wasn't just like randomly throwing that over there. Okay. Yeah. So you know, you mentioned that you guys have like a diverse pool of talent at um, Trey Gecko. You guys have, um, I like you know, to think so. quite a lot of like women, quite a lot of like people from all over the world. Was that like a conscious choice, or did it like just happen? <laughs> yes and no. Like, uh, so I would love to say that we, we don't have 50-50 in our team. Mm -hmm. I would love to say we do. What's the percentage? Are we 20 percent, maybe? Mm -hmm. I think 20, 20, 25. I, I think, like, okay. people tell me, the people in other people that tell me we're doing well, I'm like, I, until we're 50 50, I don't think we're doing it properly. Okay. Um, but it is hard because they're just, once you get past the, the first few years, they, because of the horror that is this compu the, um, the, 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 the industry these days, like, it's, it's a hard place for, mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, for women. Um, and so, what I've done is do a thing. I guess in Singapore and a lot of other countries, you've got to talk about diversity of other things as well. But I think in Singapore, where the people here are so diverse, it really just comes down to the gender is really the main diversity issue we've got here. And, um, and all I can really do, like, try the best to make sure it's welcoming and, and, and that we think nothing, like, none of that stuff is even remotely welcome in, in, in our startup company. And yes, so I, I, I've pushed a little bit to do some reach out, but it's, mm -hmm. like, if you look at incoming CVs, you're looking at 90, 95% male. Um, and so it, no, I, I so you feel like it's more of a supply issue? Uh, no, it's, it's things. It's not a supply issue. It's partly, well, a little bit. So there's, I know this, I've been reading some interesting stuff on particularly how you word uh, word, word your job posting. So uh, mm. if you put a checklist of things, um, females are more likely to not apply if they don't fit every single checklist piece on the checklist, whereas guys will apply anyway. And so we're doing, we're doing my best to make sure that we've removed any sort of gendered language, any sort of checklist, because... <coughs> The, the, I, from hiring, and it's not perfect, but we're 20%. Like the gender has absolutely nothing to do with your skills as a, as a computer science. As a, it's working with computers, and so doing my best to kind of reach out a little bit. And I said we've pulled in a few people from GA, luckily, which is they haven't had, luckily, haven't been uh, burnt out by the the, the market in any way. Uh, <laughs> I see you real looking. It's Pretty not just people. We've got we've got a few other people. Like four people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, we've, we've hired five GA grads now, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm just gonna like segue. <laughs> Ouch. You. Do you need some more wine? You <laughs> <laughs> have to cut that bit later. <laughs> like, please cut. No, you can't cut this. <laughs> you can't say shit like this on camera. <laughs> and now you made me use like a swear word. This is going really well, Brad. I don't know. If I I'm thought it was going you. pretty well. I don't know if I'm gonna invite you back here again. Okay, so before I like open it up to the floor. No, Thomas, thank you. Yes, please. <laughs> I can wait. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to ask you like a series of like rapid fire questions. Oh, we're we really to through with that stuff. Like, we're, we're, we're done. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> just go a little, bit, a little bit more first, then you can jump in. Okay, I'm just going to like, okay, so you got like about 10 seconds to answer each question. Okay, so it's going to be like really rapid. Best piece of advice anyone has given you? <laughs> <laughs> you are horrible at this. <laughs> She, she actually prepped me on this question too and I still don't have an answer. Um, no, I think this goes back to the thing that I haven't don't have gone out and reached out as many mentors as I should have. Okay, what piece of question, advice? No, this is the same answer. Like I, the, the best piece of advice, this is way past 10 seconds. Um, no, nah, I got nothing. <laughs> How stubborn are you? Yeah. <laughs> How's that working out for you? How's that working out, Brad? I feel like you're personally attacking me now. <laughs> You just gave it away that this wasn't water. <laughs> okay, favorite book and why? Um, okay, so there's a good one I went before because it's easy to explain. Mm -hmm. There's this awesome book called Blindness. It's a, it's a fiction book. It's uh, about a- Blindness. Blindness. Okay. Um, it it's really makes you think. It's about, uh, the story base is, is around, uh, there's, uh, and so actually, to be fair, it's interesting because mm -hmm. I read it thinking of New York City, but actually it's about Lisbon. Uh, he doesn't because it's where mm -hmm. he's from. He's, um, but it's a it's a city and there's an outbreak and like a mysterious outbreak. Nobody know, nobody knows what happens, but like all like one one every single person in the city goes blind, apart from this one woman and no one knows okay. why. And it's kind of like the first her husband was one of the first ones they get put in this in this I guess camp and then kind of left to, to rot and then everyone else's and it's going through the the the, the story of them kind of making that and and, and so the, the story is it's really interesting really intriguing. We're over ten seconds. Uh, People anyway, but them. and the thing is it's just, it's. The way it's written, the okay. prose is really, really nicely flowing as That's well. That's awesome. Yeah. Favorite genre and why? Favorite genre of book? I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm a big sci-fi fan. Okay. Um, it's, Authors well, you'd I'm in technology and I like sci-fi. Crazy. Um, 
Who would have guessed? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's so many interesting things come out of that. Okay. Um, I also like, like, I like reading sci-fi from the 60s. Okay. Because uh, they just like, have really like, warped ways of... It's, it's just funny reading some of these things. Like, you go back... I, there was a, I remember reading a, a Heinlein book once around... Mm -hmm. like, it was a crazy spaceship, all sorts of crazy stuff going on. But one of the core plot points was that they were stuck because they had to go find the nearest phone attached to the wall. <laughs> so like all this crazy stuff happened, but they didn't think of cellular phones. And so like that was the 60s. That's where we are today. Like the stuff that's come forward and had and some stuff that worked. Like again, where's my jetpack? Um, <laughs> all these things that we've built and all these things we haven't. Okay. Um, one person you'd like to invite to dinner, and what would you ask? They can be alive, dead, or fictional. Oh, fictional. That wasn't part of your pre-question. <laughs> I'm going to cut out fictional because that changes my original answer, which I really like. Because okay. I, I think Genghis Khan was a really interesting one for me. Okay. Like, I, and as I, said, I, I, I think it's really, I, I would really just like to know whether he was a complete psychopath or he was just a really smart guy who was doing what he needed to do, what, what was the best solution to solve that problem, to, to do that thing at the time. Does this have to do with like Great Gecko's quest for world domination? They're only semi related. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> no, but if we go fictional, I actually would really love to meet Sherlock Holmes as well. Ah. I love that guy. Yeah. Well, cool. fake guy. Yeah. Anyone got any questions? Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> Tell us your name and what you do before you ask the question. <laughs> Thomas. Right. So, hi, I'm Thomas. Um, I remember a time where Red I think that was part of the initial funding or something, thought about actually leaving to the US. And, mm. so, and maybe you can just like a little bit on that story and what went into that process. Thomas is cheating because he's an investor in Trade Girl. <laughs> 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 Maybe we should ask Thomas how's that investment working out for him. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this, uh, so no, uh, this just escalated. Answer that question. So around the Series A, we were talking to. We started off and mm -hmm. looking towards. India for money, then we went into the US, we're like, hey, look, there's a lot okay. of stuff going on. So we're talking to some really interesting VCs in the US, uh, so like top top 10 tier ones. Mm -hmm. And so we had some, we we're getting really close with, uh, there was one called DFJ, who we had a lot of conversations with. Um, but uh, again, if you've had any experience working with UC, US VCs, and more so back then, but even still pretty now, like they're, they're not willing to look past, again, mm -hmm. the thing is, if you're a, uh, a West Coast VC, you're not even looking, willing to look outside of the West Coast. Um, and so they're just not going to, they don't want to do any investments outside mm -hmm. of, especially at that level, <coughs> outside of the area. Um, and so, yeah, we were looking at, what like, became a serious conversation is what does it look like to, to move a large chunk of the team to, to the valley? Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's one of those what ifs, I guess. Um, I'm really glad with what we have now, but what, what would that have been? Um, would you consider it now? Well, so we're a very different beast now. Okay. Yeah, a very different beast. Any other questions, guys? Someone else. Yes, the person at the back. Wait, um, so so tell us your name and what you do. Uh, my name is Trisha. I run an analytics company. Uh, how do you make sure that customers that aren't in Southeast Asia, uh, like, you kind of understand their needs and kind of put their, like, satisfy their needs via your product when you're kind of based out of Singapore. And, like, particularly based, like, say, South America or Dubai. Which could be like large export hubs, but like specifically, like how do you just understand their needs and make sure that their needs are also represented uh, in your development process? Yeah. Before you answer that question, uh, where do your customers come from? What's the segmentation right now in terms of geography? Uh, so geography-wise, it's so our core customer base is actually is in the English-speaking world. So U.S., Canada, Singapore, Hong Kong, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, uh, UK. Okay. Uh, the core ones that we've got a lot throughout Europe. We actually don't have much in South America, um, but we do have a bit around the U the, the UAE sort of area. Um, but actually, we I think we've got customers in ninety different countries. Okay. Um, but our our core product is only in English, so okay. uh, so that back kind of to this it. question. Back to the question. Um, I think is based out of Singapore. I think they kind of half answered is that our core customer base isn't actually here. Um, we talked to a bunch of people in Singapore. We we talked to people all over the world. We talked to our customers all over the world. Um, and so we, yeah, there's, there's really no substitute to talking with your customers. Um, it's nice to be able to go visit them occasionally, uh, but it's, it's just, there, there's, no, there's no magic trick. You just really need to kind of to talk to them. And I, again, if we decided, to, if we need to go put, if we wanted to start making a big push into somewhere around South America, around those, those, those hubs there, I think we'd probably go spend some serious time just to, to go, go get a feeling of what they're like or find something from around there. Yeah. Awesome. Anyone got the next question? Yes. Uh, my name is Tim. I'm currently a software development company. So my question is more on product development. So especially we are in a business uh, software, uh, sometimes specific clients have very very specific requests, mm -hmm. and it's so hard to generalize them. 
So how do you actually try to do this? Do you try to build some specific module just for them? Or you try to generalize everything so that it works? Yeah, so uh, again, I think that's the difference. That's where we try to classify a we're definitely a product company rather than a services company. Um, like we do a little bit of service, but uh, at the end of the day, we will never build something specifically for one customer. It's, it's just the wrong direction for, for someone who's doing what we do. Uh, and so yeah, we will look at, at, someone comes to us with a particular use case, but well, we will look around and I think we're at the point now where we have thousands and thousands of, th of thousands of customers. So I think no one's coming to us with unique ideas that are generalized these days. If it's coming with something specific, it's almost always specific to them. And so what we do have is a, uh, we have a, a network of partners, of development partners, where we can go, hey, um, have a play with it. So we, we've built um, a core part of who, of our from our, who we are from a technology point of view is that we expose absolutely everything via API. So anything you can do in our platform in the core platform, you can do via API as well. And so we've got developer partners. We, again, if you've come to us with a very specific solution you want that we can't, that doesn't make sense for us to build as a more generalized solution, we will kind of refer them on to a development partner. And yeah, we just have a super powerful API to do pretty much whatever you like on top of that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thomas, your question? Yes, I was wondering. <coughs> How do you give equity or stakes to employees that come from like, how, how does it work at the scale of trade uh, So the question was how do ESOPs, ESOPs and equities ESOPs work at the scale of trade like hard working, uh, like in the interview, from the interview process to like how you generally manage uh, that from the quite aspect. Yeah, it's, to be honest, most of that's owned by operations these days, but we do, like, I, we do strongly feel that there should be, like, we, I, every single person who works with Trekkie has some stock of some kind. Um, we, we, like, I think it's kind of, it's partly, we want everyone to have a bit of skin in the game, but also, like, well, actually, it's mostly that. Like, we want everyone to kind of, it helps get everyone on the same page. Like, we really want to make sure that if, if, if and when, well, when we go crazy and whatever the big exit becomes, that we can make sure that everyone who's helped us get that point can kind of share in that. Um, from a, Specifics of how it works, I have no fucking idea. <laughs> um, sometimes, sometimes. Uh, I, I still remember. To be honest, about a year and a half ago now. So it's kind of we were a lot smaller, but someone was saying they wanted to join us because we were a larger, stable company. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Um, <laughs> Wait, uh, did they? This they wanted to join us because you were large and stable. Company? We were a stable, a lot more stable company than other people were talking about. Like, we were like forty-five people back then. I'm like, mm. I guess like in, in comparison, yes, but I, I, it was the first time I thought, maybe wait, wait, we're a real company. We're not just a startup anymore. Well, I, I still like to think we're a startup because that's okay. how we the mentality of things. But yeah, I, I guess I think the point is like your paycheck is always going to go through compared to some of these other people he's talking to. Yeah, so that, that I, I think that was kind of where I came from. Okay. Anyone got any other questions? Well, you still develop new products, and if you still do, because like, how do you kind of keep a pump of what products are worth developing plugins for uh, versus what are just fads? Um, I guess no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, we're, we're more about these days. It's around. We've got. We went with, we, we have solid integrations with the top four e-commerce platforms, which are most of the e-commerce market. The top two accounting platforms, which are most of the accounting market. Um, we've got kind of a couple, of, we have a third party piece to plug into like the CRMs and that sort of stuff. Um, we, 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 we're looking at it a little bit, but right now for most of like, any sort of obscure e-commerce integration, we would rather look at a third party developer. Like, well, there's a couple more we want to look at in the, in the longer term, if they've been around for a while. Um, but there's also nothing wrong with going after a fad if it, if it makes sense at the time. Um, the thing about code is you can throw it away. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to wrap this up and you guys can talk to Brad over wine in a bit. Um, what should we be looking forward to from TradeGecko, Brad? What's exciting? Um, we're, we're, not a, we're not a B2C company. Um, if you have an inventory management, uh, <laughs> any needs, you sell, buy and sell goods. We have a lot of exciting stuff happening. If you're looking for a role, a new job, very exciting. We what, solve what, real what customer roles, problems. What roles are you hiring for? Uh, I, I'm hiring for anything inside of product development. Um, okay. Are you an engineer, designer, product manager? We've got everything, I'd love to talk to you. Okay. Um, anything else, so worth having a chat? Like. <laughs> Sounds good. So we're going to wrap this up. Thank you so much, Brad, for like spending time with us. Thank you uh, for being so generous with your... <laughs> <laughs> I'm never coming back. Oh. <laughs> we get a Thomas the Train. That's all right. And, um, and that's, that's Percy. That's not Thomas. This is Thomas. No, that's not I Thomas either. I don't actually know. <laughs>
<laughs> that is Thomas. No, that's, no, that's, the, that's the Thomas. That's, that's Thomas's friend with a bigger face. <laughs> no, that is Thomas. I don't even know. It's been a long time. Yeah. Why are we arguing about this at the end of the show? <laughs> I'm like sorry, this, this is, is kind of keeps with our theme though, right? This is the most awkward fireside chat I've ever had to moderate in my entire career. Thank you, Bradley Priest. I'm, I'm and this was the one thing that SG engineers chose to like record. <laughs> live on forever. Hey, at least it was entertaining. Okay, well, for, for me and you at least. So I, I mean, other people so enjoyed it as well. Huge shout out to Trade Gecko. <laughs> <laughs> They've been awesome employers. Um, go look for them if you guys want to go work for them. Um, a shout out to JS Conference as well. It's going to happen in January 2018. If you guys want to go speak at JS Conference, they're taking in speaker applications right now. Yeah, so if you've got an interesting topic, you know, if you want to go speak up, um, that's the man you should be submitting your applications to. Okay, all right. Thank you so much, guys. And thank you so much to um, SG Engineers, um, run by Mike and a team of people. Um, they basically like you know record some um, you know they record like community events like this one and they make it available for free for the community. No. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Help yourself to some wine, and Brad will still be here for a few more minutes to talk to you. Thank you. <laughs> oh come on! <laughs> Are you waiting for this? Oh, no.